every month, every week, every night, for years on end, I read the same fairy tale. I read it out loud to my then young sons, Sam and Lucas. And every night I would suggest to them to read something else, some other fairy tale. Snow White or Little Red Riding Hood, which had always been my favorite as a child. But no, they wanted to hear the wolf and the seven gits, or as we say here in the Netherlands, the wolf and the seven goats, over and over and over again. So last month, when Lucas, my youngest son, and me were clearing out his room, we came across this drawing of the wolf and the seven goats. And he had made it in kindergarten at the age of five. So apparently there was something about this particular fairy tale that absolutely fascinated him. So, maybe there is a fairy tale that you remember from your childhood that fascinated you. Or there's a fairy tale that you as a parent like or do not like to read to your children. Have you ever wondered why? Why, of all the millions of stories that are known to mankind, fairy tales seem to affect us in a wondrous way? Time to wonder about fairy tales. Now, when I immersed into my uh, PhD research project, I immersed deeply into the world of fairy tales. And I was amazed by the number of fairy tales and fairy tale versions that exist. But it is even more amazing how many theories and ideas exist about fairy tales. Many scientists and many non-scientists have had ideas, plenty, and theories about what it is that makes fairy tales so unique and so powerful and so timeless. In the 1970s, and we heard the 1970s before, quite interesting age, apparently, um, the notorious psychoanalyst Bruno Bettelheim claimed that fairy tales are basically all about suppressed sexual urges. So for him, fairy tales were a reflection of castration anxiety, penis envy, and subconscious incestuous longing. So in his book, The Uses of Enchantment, he claims that the House of the Seven Dwarfs in Snow White represents the female sex. And this will not surprise you, but he claims that the Seven Dwarfs are really seven phalluses. But could it be less shocking than that? Psychologist Sheldon Cashton wrote an interesting book, which is called The Witch Must Die. And in this book, he says that fairy tales reflect the seven deathly sins. Now, I hope I get them all seven. If not, you help me, because you know them, of course. It's vanity, greed, lust, envy, laziness. We talked about that before. Deceit, and the last one, maybe you don't know, gluttony or excessive eating, right. Now, excessive eating we can easily recognize in the fairy tale of Hansel and Gretel, because in this fairy tale, everybody is obsessed with eating. The father and the stepmother uh, have such an enormous craving for food that they leave their children behind in the woods. And the witch locks up Hans in a cage, in order to eat him once he's fat. But the children, too, are guilty of excessive eating because they cannot stop themselves from eating candy of their gingerbread house, which causes them a lot of trouble. So what Kirsten says is that when a child hears a fairy tale, he will recognize one or more of these sins also within himself. And when then in the fairy tale the witch dies, he will see the sin disappear, and the sin that he has inside and that undermines his relationships in the family, uh, he can make that disappear from himself. And he can then become a better person and start building better relationships. 
But can it be less complicated than that? The famous fairy tale scholar Jack Sipes says that the power of fairy tales lies in, lies in the memes. And the meme behaves a bit like a gene. A meme can be seen as an idea worth spreading. So in storytelling, a meme is an element that we remember and we pass on because it is useful. It can help us overcome challenges in life, or it can even help us survive. So think of the mother warning little Red Riding Hood not to stray from the path. It was the Brothers Grimm who, 200 years ago, added this prologue to the fairy tale. And my research showed that if you ask people today to retell their version of Little Red Riding Hood, hardly anyone skips this warning. Everybody mentions it, practically. So apparently, the message of being careful when you go out on your own into the unknown world is as useful for today's children as it was for the children 200 years ago. So, a lovely book was written by Gianni Rodari called uh, The Grammar of Fantasy, and there's quite a few speakers here that uh, will love to read it. I'll tell you about it. And Gianni Rodari says that in many fairy tales, the main characters leave home. So whether voluntarily or involuntarily, Snow White, Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel, they go away from home, out into the unknown world where they face all kinds of challenges. So Rodari says that this, for a young child, mirrors the fear of being abandoned by or becoming separated from his loved ones. And he says that it is okay for us to read a fairy tale to a child over and over again because he can then explore his own anxieties in a safe and warm social context because he will know that it will give him confidence. He will know that in the end, all will be well, and they will live happily ever after. Now, when I was reading this last theory, it suddenly dawned on me that maybe this was the reason why my sons had their preference for the wolf and the seven goats. And it was not because they were going away from home, but because it was me leaving home. Because as a working mom, and not unlike Mother Goat, who you see over there, I went uh, away to go to work every day and left them with the nanny. But could it be simpler than that? Now, the well-known academic Theo Meda from the Meertes Institute in Amsterdam says that the power of fairy tales lies in their simplicity. Fairy tales shine in simplicity. They give us hope, and they breathe optimism, and they have done so down long before TED Talks existed. <laughs> because no matter if you're the youngest or the smallest, no matter how desperate the situation in a fairy tale, by a magical spell, by being smart, or by sheer luck, your chances can change and, and you get to inherit the kingdom. So if you're swallowed by a wolf, a hunter will stop by and he'll get you out of the valley. And if you're a dirty nobody, you still get to marry the prince. And if you, you have a cat, buy him a pair of smart boots because he will make sure that you get very, very rich. So that brings me back again to why the wolf and the seven goats. So when I was preparing this talk, I asked Lucas to think real hard. Come on, help me. You need to prepare the talk. What was it that you liked so much about the wolf and the seven goats? And he said, what I liked most was the youngest goat hiding in grandfather's clock. Because every time when we would go 
to our grandparents' house, I would see a similar clock. And it reminded me of the fairy tale and vice versa. Simple as that. So, how does my tale end? Remember that I said in the beginning that we were clearing out Lucas's room? This was because he was moving out. He's now living here in the city of Breda, where he's studying. And although he never cared much for Little Red Riding Hood, he's confident enough. And he's full of optimism. And I, as a parent, know that like any young person who leaves home, he will meet challenges along the way. But I'm sure that he will live happily ever after. Thank you.